Good morning, and welcome to another exciting edition of Day 4 with the man Frank Scalish. And folks, every once in a while, we have a very important show where we talk about uh, something that, that really needs to be talked about. And usually we have Frank on, but Frank is getting ready because today we are talking about the important issue of catch and release into the grease. <laughs> Catch and that release right. into the grease. This is like, this is so weird. I, I've, I'm never nervous and I'm nervous. Are right you? Now. Well, I mean, you're channeling your inner, inner cooking show. It is that time of the year where you gather around the TV and you watch holiday baking championships. But uh, every you, you did. did it. Did you do a chowder recipe? Yeah, we did year, a Frank? walleye cheek chowder recipe last year. And it is phenomenal. It's on, I forget what episode it's on, but it's on one of the episodes. And um, so I had, because thanks to Matt, I had been going out and catching obscene giant crappies here. And so I had posted a, um, I posted an Instagram of some giant crappies I caught. And the last picture in the post was big fillets on a plate, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then, mm -hmm. and it got a really good response. So, um, I have a unique, I think it's a unique crappie recipe. Um, so I'm going to, I want to share that with you, but what we're going to do is we're going to actually, we're actually going to cook. I got a big backstrap from a big crappie. We're going to actually cook that. And then, and then later on after the show for lunch, I am going to make a crappie taco but we're right, not gonna i'm not gonna make the crappie taco for on air i'm just gonna show you how to cook it show you the spices i use etc for those listening on itunes frank is in his kitchen in cleveland ohio he has uh stainless steel pans out uh the sun appears to be shining the kitchen is looking immaculate by the way it literally looks like something you would see on on a cooking channel kitchen uh yeah i, I guess um <laughs> Go ahead. I uh, just I see some some oil. You have the stainless steel pan. You've got some tongs out. You've got all sorts of stuff. So what what I guess I'm going to do is then kind of turn it over to you for the cooking portion with Frank Scalish, and then and then uh, you're going to mosey back upstairs for the uh, to your studio for the second half of the show. Correct. And there are some insane uh, insane deals over at LureNet that uh, well you get to the cooking episode because you know we talk about lure net in the second half so right so yeah the, we'll talk about all the black friday deals and stuff on lure net later um the, you know right now there's a the, the one trick that should i just go into it yeah that's what we're here for i'm here to do is this okay. the same is this somewhat the same recipe that you cooked the walleye with for me when i came and visited it's similar okay because that was a, absolutely insane yeah, it's similar. So okay. how first, about it? The floor okay. is here. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to get Bisquick. Here, I'll just zoom it in. Bisquick. And then I'm going to get all-purpose flour, which I already I already had. And so the whole key, the whole key here is 50-50. 50% all-purpose flour and 50% Bisquick, which I'm going to add the Bisquick in right now, and we'll get the show on the road here. So I didn't add it in prior because you can't tell the difference once it's in there. So basically, all I'm going to do is it's just a 50-50 mix, and now comes the good stuff. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get, let's get the spices out here. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is ground black pepper. And when I say add it, here I'll show you. I'm putting a lot in there. And I'll show you what it looks like in a minute. Then I'm going to get sweet paprika because you want that sweet smoky flavor. That That's key. So the sweet pep paprika... If I could open these, see, that's why they always have them on the cooking channel in little plastic things and they dump them in so they don't run into this. 
All right, we add that. Mm -hmm. And wow. you see you see I'm not measuring anything. Mm -hmm. And then cayenne pepper. Okay. Because you got to have the cayenne. That gives it a nice little bite. Just a just a dab of cayenne, or it looks like that's probably what a teaspoon. Oh, it's more than that. It is. You kept going. Yeah. So here, I'll show you what. Hopefully, this doesn't slide on me. Okay. So I've got my black pepper, my cayenne, and my smoked paprika. Mm -hmm. And you see, it's a lot. I mean, I'm not cheap okay. on the spices. Okay. So then I'm gonna get thyme dry thyme and i'm gonna just hit it up with dry thyme and then of course no fish is complete without salt and so i'm gonna add the salt pretty liberally okay. and now here's the here's the trick okay so i put the lid on this thing and i'm gonna mix mix all the spices up Super there. easy. You're just doing it in a little Tupperware container. Yeah, super simple Tupperware container, big enough to house the filet. Now, I'm going to smell this because I want to smell the cayenne pepper. If you can't smell the cayenne pepper, you don't have enough in there. So I'm going to, so I smell it. It smells really good. I, I could smell the black pepper and the cayenne pepper. So now, here's the cool, here's the cool thing. So what I have here is not is I have a walleye, I mean a crappie backstrap in ice water. Okay. No eggs, no nothing. This is very, very, very simple. So what I'm gonna do is I take, oh, you know what? First, first I gotta get get us going here with the oil because the oil is gonna take a minute. Oh, that's the old school way to light it. Well, I have one burner that one igniter that's out. I got you. And I can't figure out how in the heck to replace it. So what type of oil are we working with here? I'm using canola oil right here. And so basically I'm putting enough oil in the pan to, to cover the filet. Okay. So now the problem now is I didn't do this. I should have lit the pan first and got the oil hot so I can just do it and dump it in. That's so fine. Now, we, we got plenty to chat about while that oil warms right. up. Right. So so here, let's go back to this process. So ice water. That's all you need, ice water. You soak the fillets in ice water and leave them in the ice water. So How long? I'm, like overnight or a couple hours? Or it, It's irrelevant. I've, I've done it immediately after filleting them. Okay. So then I'm going to just hold the hold the fillet up there. And look at that. that that's, a, that's just, this is just a backstrap of a crappie. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to hold the filet up there and I'm going to lay it right into my, my mixture here, put the lid on. This is, this is too easy. I'm going to put the lid on and all I'm going to do is just shake the crud out of it for a minute, get it all nice and coated in flour and it won't be heavy. It'll be a light dusting on this filet. And so I'm going to just leave it in here for a minute while the oil heats up. Because the worst thing you want to do and the biggest mistake you make is putting that fish in before the oil's hot enough to start frying it. Mm -hmm. Because then it becomes an oil sponge and it just sucks up all the oil. You don't want that. You want to hit it in that fryer and you want so it goes and it seals everything, all the juices and everything right into that fish. Now, remember, I didn't season the fish. I seasoned. I seasoned the, my mix and I seasoned it heavy. That's mm -hmm. right. It's like shake and bake. <laughs> Not help. Dude, you are, you're giving up your age right now, just so you know. So I'm watching my oil. It's starting to get spidery. You know how it looks mm -hmm. like the oil's crawling on the bottom of the pan. So mm -hmm. we're getting, we're getting fairly close right now. Now that style of burner gets hot more. Oh yeah. More, more quickly. Or or faster than electric. Uh, the elect the electric burner. Correct. Because that's Elect just straight blue flame on the bottom of that stainless steel pan. That's true. And and the the pan I'm using has a half inch stainless block underneath it. It helps the pan from warping. It's it prevents warping. It holds the heat. Like after I get done using this pan, I'll set it aside and it'll be hot for an hour. 
afterwards. So you got to okay. be, you know, you got to be careful with that. Any reason you're going with canola as opposed to vegetable or peanut? Well, my wife, my wife's allergic to peanut oil. Okay. That's a great reason. <laughs> because, because actually I've done it in peanut oil. I've done it in um, avocado oil. Really? Av- avocado I, oil. Avocado oil has a burn temperature um, than most of your other oils, but I've done it in peanut oil, canola, vegetable, and avocado. And actually, um, the avocado oil is nice. Canola seems to do the best, Mm -hmm. um, you know, seems to do the best for me. It gives me the less, less problems. Um, you never want to deep fry anything in olive oil. Um, I mean, you, you can, but it's heavy. You know, that's more of a saute deal where you mix the olive oil with the butter to get, to get kind of a saute there. Everyone, uh, on the, uh, comments is saying that it's, that you need to be drinking some sort either, uh, Charlie would like you to be drinking a glass of wine. Terry is disappointed (laughs) that you don't have a bloody Mary. Well, theoretically I don't drink wine, but you know. When I'm doing dinner, beer is not out of the question. Wait, you're a guy who <laughs> you're a guy who grew up in Cleveland, and you don't drink wine. Yeah, I'm Italian, and we used to make wine, and I don't drink wine. Like, I just you I, used to make this, wine personally, like illegally fam- in the basement. Yeah, my family did. We had a oh, wow. a wine cellar with all the wooden barrels in it. Oh, cool. Dr- drunk would would have loved it, man. Those barrels were old, ancient. Yeah. They had a lot of patina on them, dude. Uh, John would like to know if that's a JDM pan that you're using straight from uh, Japan. <laughs> no, it is a. I can't even read it. Caffalon, I believe. OK, uh, how do you know you said the spider, but how are you going to test that oil before? It, yes, I'm going to actually test it right now. And all I'm going to do is. I'm going to stick my finger. No, I'm not going to put my finger in <laughs> I am just going to take the filet, and I am just going to touch. It's not quite there. We're, we're super close. Okay. I'm just going to touch it in there. I want that thing to start sizzling, and then we'll be, and then we'll have, because it's a, it's a really thick filet, so mm-hmm. it'll probably be about three and a half to four minutes before we're we're done with uh, it. Nick wants to know, uh, you don't pat the water, the extra just, water off. No, the back just drip it. Let it drip for a minute and then throw it right in the flour mixture, shake it up. And you can see how it's got, you could see it's got a nice, a, mm-hmm. a nice light coating on it. It's not real thick, like cornmeal, cornmeal gets real thick and you know, like they do a lot of catfish with the cornmeal. It gets real crunchy. It's really thick. That's not what you want. These crappie fillets are very delicate. And so they, t- and they take spice really well uh, because they're, because they're not a very fishy fish. You can get the flavors out of it. Is there a reason why you don't go with an, a, a milk or an egg and milk wash before you dip the fillet? Yeah, because I don't, I don't like the breading thick and heavy i want okay. it a very light crispy breading and when this filet comes out i'll show it to you it is it's crispy as could be and it's super thin it's a super thin layer it's actually it's delicious okay so i i think we might be good to go now we're going to test it again just by barely done what are you looking for you're looking for a little pop there it goes i just want ooh, it to start bubbling ooh, yep. i can see it bubbling right there Okay, so we're in. Ooh, yeah, that looked absolutely perfect, Frank. It is. So now we're at. We're, oh, we you gotta, can hear it. You hear that? I can hear it. That's the si- the sizzle yeah. of happiness. That's right. I don't want to put my face too close to that, in case I get a little, you know, water pop coming off of it. Are we timing this, or are we doing it by feel? A little bit of both. It's hard. It's it's um it's hard to tell because the thicker the fillet, the longer it takes. Um, so I keep an eye on it. I looked at the clock. Give myself about three minutes, and then I'll flip it over for a minute or two, and it'll be good to go. Crappie cooks uh, pretty quick. 
especially if you're up to up to heat on it, mm -hmm. it, it'll cook pretty quickly. And what are you looking for consistency wise of that meat? color? Because because oh, isn't it easy to overcook? I've always noticed it. I mean, and we've cooked crappie yeah. together. I feel like it. The easiest thing you can do, or the worst thing you could do, is overcook the crappie. Yeah, if you if you overcook it, it becomes I don't want to say dry, but it it kind of does become dry. So what mm -hmm. you want, what you really want is when you break your fillet, the muscle segment will come apart. Um, that's how, and it'll be white. Okay. It'll be it'll be nice and white, and it won't be dry. Um, if you overcook it, I don't want to say it gets rubbery. But it, but it could get rubbery on you, but it's not bad. I mean, it's not like calamari, where if you overcook calamari, it's like chewing a rub band. So now, so it's this has actually been in there now for about a minute and a half, and I can start to see it's getting brown around the edges. So before I flip it, I'm going to let it go a little bit longer because I want to see the brown creeping up over the top of the fillet. Oh, that's and, how you know that the other side is, is nice and correct. I want it nice and like golden. I don't want it burnt, but I want it golden. Was that a state record crappie? That looks like a massive fillet. <laughs> it's a massive fillet. No, it was about a 15 and a half incher. Okay. So now you're taking, this is a good, oh, look at that. Beautiful. You take the fork to get under it and then catch it with the tog so you don't uh, break right. up the fillet. Exactly. I don't want to grab it and squeeze it with the tongs because if it's cooked properly, it'll crack in half. And so now we're looking really good. So this is actually cooking well. Mm -hmm. um, I got about another minute or so to go on it and it's done. And it's a, it's a, it's a big thick. I'll show mm -hmm. you, uh, I'll pick it up and I'll show you, I'll put it close to the, computer when i'm done here let me uh grab a plate we're in frank's kitchen he, he's grabbing a, a a plating plate now you go in paper towel on that plate or just straight no so oh, here's yeah. what I, here's what i have so i have a screen and yep. on the bottom of the screen over here i have a couple paper towels okay so you're getting all the excess out without uh I'm compromising let it, the integrity of the meat correct i'm gonna let it air drip that's how it stays crispy so now i believe let me do, do a check here you're just gonna pull it apart you're gonna check both sides of it i'm checking for color it looks good i'm shutting the burner off now i'm gonna grab this beast let the excess drip off into the pan. I'm going to lay it on my screen and then I am going to a little bit of salt on that bad boy. And now let me move this pan so I don't be careful. Uncle Frank burn the living, you know what out of myself. Yep. That burner off. Oh yeah. I did that last week. I left a burner on for nine hours. So you can see how nice and golden that is. It's not burnt. It's nice and golden brown. Mm -hmm. And see, when I grab it with the tongs, it wants the meat wants to flake. So that's perfectly cooked right there. I should have eaten breakfast. No kidding. And that that's it, guys. That's it. I mean, now I'll just let that thing sit for a minute, and then after the show, I'll dice up some lettuce, tomatoes. I'm going to get um, horseradish sriracha, and I'm going to make a crappie taco for lunch. Nice. Yeah, so uh, people lunch. wanting to know, uh, Scott's wanting to know, Nick, are we doing any... Are you making any of your own sauces? Like, are you making your own tartar sauce, or are you just going with store-bought sauces? Yeah, I do. I do do tartar sauce. Um, I do do store bought stuff, and um, you know, like you could mix horseradish and ketchup and get a shrimp sauce going. Um, you know, your your tartar sauce basically is you know mayonnaise, diced up pickles, or, or relish, just mayonnaise and relish, and you could add a little heat to it by adding a little sriracha. 
you know, there's a million different things you can do to it. Um, I'm not heavy on the sauces. I'll, I, you could squeeze a lemon over the thing because it will need citrus. Mm-hmm. If, if you're going to use any sauces with, you know, a mayonnaise base to it, you're going to want the acid. So you're going to have to add the citrus to it because it's going to be kind of fatty tasting if you don't. Just remember, anytime you use anything fatty, citrus cuts the fat. And then if you're going to use, if you're going to cook with hot stuff like um, ghost peppers or chili peppers and stuff like that, mayonnaise will cut the heat to make it flavorful, hot, but flavorful and edible. Because you could literally make food that is so hot, it's not even edible. And that's not the point. Um, the, The cayenne pepper in this crappie gives it a bite, but there's, it gives it a bite and a, little heat level but nothing crazy like um frankie's not a big hot pepper guy but he'll eat these things by the book basket full so so it's it's flavorful it's got a little bite to it but it's flavorful um that's kind of you know that's how i do it uh there's other recipes for you know for fish like you can do olive oil and butter Mm-hmm. And and bake it. If you don't want to fry it, you could bake it. I mean, there's a million different ways to make it, but this is one of my favorite ways to eat mm-hmm. to eat crappie. Um, and actually, I like crappie better than perch, and way better than walleye. Crappie's my all time favorite. Um, perch to me is a little bit fishy, requires a little more finesse. You know, some guys like that taste though. Have you ever tried the Carolina Reaper, Uncle Frank? I have. I have. Um, very much to my dismay. <laughs> like it's, it's that bad. So I think that's like a million, yeah. so, million four Scoville yeah. heat. I was just watching. So in the past couple months, they came out. The same gentleman who invented the Carolina Reaper. Did you see that been... on Dirty Jobs? No. They had it on Dirty Jobs. The same guy who invented it. Did you see what yeah. he just came out with? Pepper no. X. Uh huh. It's like two point six million Scoville. So a Scoville. I don't know how I went down this wormhole, but I did last week. That's is okay. How much water you have to use use to dilute the pepper to where you don't taste the spice? So it used to be subjective, but because of science, they now can objectively say, "Hey, here it is per parts of water." So like if uh, if a uh, jalapeno is six thousand or eight thousand, so this is two point six million Scovels. It's called Pepper X, and uh, there's like three people in the world who have eaten one. He's who have eaten like a full one, just you know off the stem. He's one of the ones yeah. He he did he did that with his Carolina Reapers on Dirty Jobs. Yeah, he just grabbed it, and then one of the cameramen said, yeah, let me do that. He did it and he passed out and started puking. Yeah. All right. Uh, here's what we're going to do. I want you to run through real quick. Just again, that dry uh, rub. It's not a oh. rub or the the biscuit. It's it's half flour, half flour, AP flour, all purpose flour, half flour, okay. half bisquick. OK. And that's key because I had not seen I mean, maybe yeah. I'm old school or whatever, but I hadn't or young new school, but I had not seen Bisquick in a fish batter recipe before. Yeah, it really, it really crunches it up. It really gets it golden brown. Um, if I just use straight flour, it would be much paler when okay. I'm done cooking it. Okay. Um, and then, and then you're gonna want, you're gonna want, f- you know, fine crushed black pepper, salt, salt, for sure, salt. Sweet paprika, because you, you want that smoky flavor. You want that. Sweet that was key when you did flavor. that with me. I have not used the sweet paprika before, and when you cooked the walleye when right. I was there, the sweet paprika was uh, was an insane addition. Right now, I like to put thyme in mine, and so I'll add the thyme, yeah. and then of course we're going to go with the cayenne pepper. Okay, very and simple, very easy. Right. It's very simple, very easy. You'll love the flavor. It's not heavy. It's not a heavy, heavy fish. It's very light, in fact. And that's why I love it so much. Because now I do, I have a salmon recipe. Maybe we'll do that later. 
That's absolutely 100% foolproof and restaurant quality. It's a piece of cake and it's literally takes six minutes. Um, it is the best salmon ever. So we'll, maybe we'll get into that one time here in the future. That'll work. All right. Burner off. Burners off. Fish is, yeah. fish is, is resting, getting ready for the fish the crappie taco that's going to take place after the show's over. Correct. Amundo. Okay. Right. We're good to uh, go. Grab the computer, head back upstairs to the studio. I'm going to go full screen. I'll see you when you get back up there. Uh, Give me a minute. There's a bunch of stuff going on at uh, LureNet as we head into the holiday season. What I want uh, Frank to do as he as he heads uh, heads back upstairs. There we go. Uh, what I want Frank to do is to uh, come back on when he gets upstairs. As I get to watch him down in the bottom <laughs> traverse the the three stories up to his studio is uh share some of the lure net stuff and what i want frank to do is talk about what colors uh what colors we need because uh there is still a code for lure net on everything for btl that is uh that is on full priced items uh what code is that L loyal listener code is btl23 capital btl23 for 15 percent off regularly priced items but that does not apply to what is going on here we have some 75 percent off bargains and blowouts 50 percent off the hard knockers one knockers rogues custom crappie colors in the bandits there's new stuff in the uh in the paint shop so what I would like Frank to do when we get back on is to talk about some of the key colors uh, that you guys can stock up on. And we'll bring Frank back in here. Okay. You back? I am back. Back in action. That was, uh, that was phenomenal, Frank. That was fun. Look out, Bobby Flay. I'm coming for you. Yeah, beat Bobby <laughs> Flay. What's the one right. where they're like, and the secret ingredient is... Fresh Iron chef. <laughs> and then everyone goes nuts and they're like, oh my God, crappie. Iron chef. They open America. up the basket. All right. Uh, I pulled up the. Let me see if I can. I got to add this. There I got go. flour all over me. No, you did that very good. I pulled up the lure net deal. Uh, we don't do this very often, but sometimes we just go straight hard sell with what's going on at lure net and this is one of those times <laughs> well but you got but you have to understand something this is important because the deals are sick like you're getting 50 percent off booyah one knockers and hard knockers that's half price and these are the paint shop colors and and here if you're going to go through that that's the one you're on right now is one of my favorite colors in in that bait um it's just astronomical um you know party craw and then there's another one it's like an oil finish that's just it's just crazy good goldie nope um goldie's good too for the guys in florida that one right there beady craw that is a great great color because that's also it's, out of stock is it and of course it is. is yeah Okay, so anyhow, but uh, graffiti craw, that craw right there. Goldie's really good if you guys have lakes that have golden shiners in them. Mm -hmm. Goldie is an exceptional golden shiner looking color. Um, it really translates very well in the water. Um, it, looks, it looks very realistic. Um, the other colors that are really good are the G-finish ones. Uh, G finish red and G finish brown. There's the G finish brown. And then that's brown. And then the red one is really cool. So three ninety nine. Do you know how long the sale lasts? Um, uh, probably I'm going to guess and say probably till they run out of them, which will be probably by the end of the month for sure. I guarantee right. it. They're and already out of, they're out of the pro rogues. They're gone. All of them. All of them. Oh, gone. okay. Well, never mind on that. There might then. be one color left. I'm not sure which one it is. The crappie, the, the Bandit 300 crappie baits are gone. Um, the crappie guys got on those in a big, fluffy way. So there's still a bunch of crappie guys that troll these things. That, how could that color not be great for smallmouth? 
Oh, it would be, dude. One hundred percent would be electric chicken. Right, dude. I mean, come on. It's one of the it's one of the best crappie colors out. That that and and uh, monkey milk, which there's a, there was a monkey milk crankbait in there too that I did. Yeah, there it is, right there. Uh, also, and then here, this is really near and dear to my heart. You could buy a bulk bundle of of Norman DD twenty twos or Norman Fat Boys. So if you buy six of them, you get you're getting twenty percent off. If you, you buy six of the same color, you're getting twenty percent off. And you guys know we're bass fishermen. You never buy one of anything because if you run out of it on the water, you're you're decimated. Yep. Um, I was I was on Kerr Reservoir and I was fishing a deep little end to, in tandem with the DD twenty two using lavender shad. This is back in the day when I was fishing Bassmasters and I was fishing lavender shad. And I always, lavender shad, chartreuse and blue, and tropical shad, I have dozens and dozens of them. Because one of those colors is going to work somewhere. Those are the old school colors, okay? So what happened was I'm on Kerr Reservoir. I can't catch any fish. Well, I back off the break lines and I start fishing the deep little end in the DD 22 and lo and behold, I start smashing on them. So I have in my truck, when I was running Bassmasters, I have bins of tackle in my truck with everything that's in my boat. I have in the bed of my truck and I had them six deep. Okay. Then when I would come home from an event, I would go to the basement and I would say, I, you, I took three of these out of the truck. I got to replace those three. So I'd go to the basement. I grabbed three, put them back in the truck. Somewhere along the line, I forgot to replace the lavender shad. I'm down to one deep little N in lavender shad left. I go to my truck after that first day and I have zero in the truck. <laughs> so I start scrambling, going to every tackle store, store that was still open after the event. Nobody had lavender shad. Nobody. I got one, one left. The next day of the tournament, my second or third cast, I catch one, throw them in the live well. I cast out again. I snag up on a, on a brush pile and flip and lost the bait. <laughs> and I struggled. I struggled like mad the rest of the day. Didn't get a check and didn't make the cut. <laughs> that was kind of kind of on you. It was totally on me. And I and I never ever 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 am not deep on them. Like mm -hmm. my boxes in the boat will have three to four, and if it's a really good color that I'm really catching them on, I'll have five in the boat because I I never want to be without them. And, and you know how things go. Sometimes you just have a, you run into a streak of bad luck where you're, you know, you, you, you snag them too deep. You can't get them. Even the plug knocker sometimes won't get them out. Um, you know how that goes. And so I'm, I'm never without them. And I was without them in that event. And so I re, I repurposed every thing the way all my whole system, I redid my system where I actually would write down on a, on paper, what I took out of the truck to put back in the boat, because you can't remember everything. You know, when you're gone for two or three events in a row, you don't remember every bait that you had to replace. And so I started writing it down and then I would have a sheet of paper with everything that needed to be added back to the truck when I got home. One of the things that I'm going to do for next year that I haven't done in a number of years is I have a podge podge of uh tackle boxes whether they be the 3600s or all that well uh i'm, I'm going all i'm going to get all new boxes to reduce rust to create yeah. uh to create unity is not the word consistent <laughs> to create consistency across the whole tackle system and i sat down and i looked it up and it's for a couple hundred bucks i can replace all of my boxes and have them all you need to do that and here's another trick any of your crankbaits take all the hooks off of them mm -hmm. because the hooks even in the bed of your truck covered you'll have condensation in there and the hooks are the first things to rust 
especially if you've sharpened them. Once you mm -hmm. take that finish off the hook, it's susceptible. Um, you know, I'll, I'll change hooks three times a day, sometimes more depends mm -hmm. if I'm fishing rock, I'll change them very often. Um, and it seems like a waste of money, but if you think about it, if you're fishing for 50,000 or a hundred thousand, what's $20 worth of hooks in it. Aren't day? you the one who you, we, didn't we do a show on determining if your hook is sharp on how you determine whether a hook needs to be replaced or not? Yeah, if it you just take the hook and I have a hook right here. You just take the hook on your thumbnail and you, you just slide it across your thumbnail and if it sticks to your thumbnail it's sharp. And Don't, if it doesn't change if, it. If it doesn't you can sharpen it, but you got to understand which hooks you're using because some hooks will only take yep. a good sharpening once or twice. And then, and then I don't have my sharpening stone here, but I can show you on this eraser. So what I'll do is I'll take the hook. This is the hook that I got grief for, by the way, from everybody screaming about it. But I'll sure. take the hook and I'll I'll put it like this, so it's on my thumb. Up a little, uh, yep, up a little. And, and the hook point, go. and the hook point is facing me. And then I'll take my sharpener and I go away from me once, twice. And then I'll do it on the other side once, twice on the other side. And then I'll give it the test. And if it sticks in my thumb, I'm good to go. But if you sit there and you hammer on the thing, trying to sharpen it, what you're doing is you're taking a nice thin hook point and you're making it fatter, more like a chisel. It gets fatter. And the fatter it is, the less penetration you have. You want it. A, you want a super thin hook now you run the risk of rolling a hook point over from time to time but you don't it doesn't especially crankbait fishing you're you're going to get way more hookups you're going to land way more fish because it penetrates almost the minute the fish grabs the bait he's hooked and so that's you know that's the key and just remember like some hooks won't take sharpening very well so you have to be really ginger. What I use is called a ruby stone. And you can get it at um, hair salon places and stuff that sells um, nail, you know, nail stuff. The ruby stone is a super, super fine sandstone and it's pink. Usually it's pink. It's a super, super fine, fine sandstone. And it's about the size of a pencil. Is that it? No, it's it's uh it's the size of a pencil. You'll have to go to a, like a, a beauty salon and look for it. Um, that's where I get them at. They're inexpensive, and I have probably a half a dozen in my boat at all times. Um, and this doesn't take a lot. It's that's similar, but the ruby stone is pink. But that'll work. That's an that's an ultra fine. You want an ultra fine, very fine stone. Um, and I don't have one up here and it really bums my head out. Cause it, if there, I showed I it, it, yeah, you probably got it. There it is. Yeah. So there there's, well, that's for knives. That's round. This thing is rectangular in shape, but anyhow, you want it real fine. Like I, I like that's pretty much it right there, except it's thinner. Um, but, but. You don't want to take a lot of metal off the hook. You just want to finesse the point of the hook. You want to get any barbs off of it, any burrs, and it'll be needle sharp and it will, it lasts a pretty good time, long time. Um, the, the Gamagatsu bronze hooks mm -hmm. are very susceptible to sharpening. They'll take a, they'll give you a really good hook point about three times and then you got to replace it the black nickel hooks are a little stronger um they can hold up a little bit better um but the problem with the black nickel hook is is that once you start taking too much metal off the hook it's fat and so i will only take the black nickel hooks and sharpen them once and you but it'll last you a little while it's not like you're going to catch a fish and throw the hook out It'll last you a little while. Um, and I don't, on my crankbaits, I don't use 2X hooks. 
Um, I want a thin hook for penetration. I'll fight the fish. He's not going to, I haven't had a bass straighten out a crankbait hook in my life. And so the guys that say they get them, their hooks straightened out all the time on crankbaits, they're using too stiff a rod. They're using heavy line and they're hammering on these fish. Because when I square bill, I'm using 17 or 20 pound fluoro and I catch big fish and mm -hmm. I'm not even bending the hook. You know, now I've had catfish come and twist everything up where I, I just take the hooks off and put them in a little Tupperware container and never see them again. But, you know, <clears throat> at the uh, at the risk of sounding uneducated, never. When did. Excalibur. OK, those hooks that had the twist in them. Yeah, that used to be that. Are, what was the deal with those? Do they still make those because those used to come on all the fat free shads and some right. of the other the Excalibur obviously the Excalibur baits and there were two versions there was a bronze version and then there was also a black nickel version of those hooks that that twisted they were I don't even know how to describe that hook but yeah, that but, always seemed to be like the holy grail of cranking hook back yeah. in 20 years ago right it was like it was like a rifled hook almost Okay. So the minute the fish grabbed it, it spun and penetrated into the fish. Um, that hook was a, actually, that hook was a fantastic hook. The one thing I didn't like about it, it was a chisel point. Okay. And so if you don't sharpen those exactly on the same angle, um, you actually dull them. You do more harm than good on them. If it was a conical hook, I think... If it was a conical hook, I would have had a million of them by now because I took them all off my baits and I saved them all. And then I had a friend of mine last year who loved the hook so much and he was freaking out because he couldn't get them. And I said, I got a surprise for you. And I gave him about a hundred of them. And he was like, so happy. <laughs> was that a Pradco hook or did they, I mean, they were the only ones yeah, that had the hook. Yeah, it was a, it was a specially made hook. Specific. Why'd they go away from those? I think they just in general got away from terminal tackle. I got you in general, but I, cause they used to have tungsten slip sinkers and mm -hmm. everything. Yeah, you're right. And the uh, line silver thread and right. The silver thread. Like, like I was a, a silver thread junkie. Yeah. Um, I remember back in the day. And I, and, and like I had so much silver thread that when you remember from a bunch of, episodes ago probably a half a year ago i'm i'm out of all my lower diameters yep. in silver thread so that's why i started going sunline because i need to find another fluorocarbon that i could that i can mix you know that that had the same line diameter etc cetera, etc cetera. and then i'm finding other stuff out you know about the sunline because because uh, you know i'm i'm a lunatic when it comes to that mm -hmm. stuff um <laughs> once a week gets you yeah, John said he saw, saw the house at BTL <laughs> once a week is must be good Frank yeah don't forget the guys I uh I was fishing for 15 years and designing baits for 15 years before it before this so <laughs> but yeah I rebuilt that whole kitchen I had Frankie come over he helped me sand the floors down the hardwood floors because that was a nightmare and then I took all the cabinets out and apart and sanded them all down and repainted them all, um, which was another nightmare. The more I the more I get to know Frankie, the more I start to think he might be one of the handiest guys that I know. He is From motors to home improvement to everything. He just seems like he, he he's a handy guy. He is. He's, he redid his house. He bought a house that him and his buddy redid the whole the whole thing. They had to build a whole new front entrance way on it and everything. Um, you know, actually I love traveling with him because I don't worry about anything. Mm -hmm. Um, because between his mechanicals and how he can rig a bass boat, no matter what problems we encounter, we can tackle them. And, and it's a lot of fun actually. Like we de re redid my trailer, um, a couple years ago, we went to, it was still snowing out. We had a warm day. So I said, let's go get the trailer done. So we went to this lake dumped the boat in the water, cracked the ice, got the boat in the water, tied it up, and we busted all the bunks off the trailer. We brought sanders with us. We sanded down all the brackets. 
you know, re-rust proofed them, etch primed them, painted them, and then put new brand new bunks on it and everything. And we did that in the parking lot in one afternoon. All right, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, I got to share this screen because we have done shows on this before. And this is uh, this is a stupid, stupid good deal. So the lead main thing, 75 percent off bargains and blowouts. The first thing that I'm seeing here are the lure blank kits. They're oh, eight dollars. Yeah. They're eight dollars and seventy five cents for the hooks, the packaging, the blanks, everything. And, and you're getting five baits. Or yeah. six baits. How many baits in there? Five or six? I can't uh, read it. I can't six. read that. Six original DD-22 lure blank bodies. Twelve number two treble hooks. Eighteen split rings. Six piece blister packaging. If you want to package it, all of your stuff by itself. Here's here. Here's a picture of everything. That. Yeah. That's, Eight dollars and 75 cents. That's the best. That's one of the best deals on the planet right there. That because might be the best deal. Uh, we sound like QVC now. I don't give a damn. <laughs> hey, that's how Mike Rowe got his start. Yeah. Hurry now. If you Hurry are just now. three easy payments of $1.97. But don't act yet because with that kit, you get. There's more. What? Split rings? <laughs> Shut the front door. <laughs> you had me at blanks, but you throw in split rings? That's right. I, but yeah, I mean, it's a great, it, it, the, like that's for anybody that paints or is getting into painting. This is your opportunity to get these, get these packs because you're basically, you're getting six baits for the cost of one. Uh, they so, have little ends, know. DD 22s and the XCS ones. And, and that's super spook junior. Oh, so you could wait a second. So for nine, 99 you can get six clear super spook juniors yeah 100 percent. it's like a dollar something a bait and there's a bunch of guys who throw them clear oh yeah no question about it might have to order some of those uncle frank that's a that's a no-brainer order right there but yeah so i mean there's a lot of stuff going on i mean i mean um you know what 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 Lurnet talked about doing was having black friday sales for the month of november but having them with baits people want mm -hmm. it's it's one thing to say it's you know 75 percent off if it's something you don't want yeah oh, you know this what i is, mean big deal this is one of those it. that i've got like old ones of and it's in every old tackle box you have not ever talked about that crankbait the humpback oh dude the humpback Hasn't that the, been around since like the Civil yeah, War? Yeah, and so that color right there is 035. And that is that is the bone of the plastic and brown with the orange belly. It's the simplest color on earth. But for whatever the reason, that was my number one go-to color. Remember the um, Rebel Deep We Are? Yeah, you thought when I when you thought I could get my hands on some at a tackle shop, you about lost your mind. You said buy as many as you can find. I was like, yeah, someone beat me to it. Right, because because that that was, dude. I caught an eight pound. I caught an eight pounder on it on Smith Lake. I caught every one of my fish on it. It was a Jerry Ryan tournament, and I think I took eighth, I eighth or fourteenth in it, and I caught every one on the the rebel deep we are in 035 crop header huh uh, uh real a, quick mike wants to know will spike it pens work on the blanks clay said they will but if you want to buy the blanks and you don't you're not into painting can you use a spike it pen yeah it'll wear off um it'll definitely wear off because the spike it pen is designed to penetrate plastisol uh soft plastic baits now they have a blade die that'll stay on better, but the blade die is a pain in the neck because it goes on weird. Um, and, and I don't like the smell of the blade die. It smells too medicinal for me. Um, I've used it. I gotta be honest with you. I was on, I was on Gunnersville one time and I didn't have any red chrome rattle baits. And so I was taking my black, chrome black back chrome and dipping them in red blade dye and hanging them up in my hotel room 
to dry overnight. And that's what I was using. Um, but God, I can't, that smell just, bleh. <laughs> I hear it was you. horrible. Any other baits you want to highlight, Frank? Or I got a, I got an industry question then, cause you've lived through it and we're living through another, this is I'll spring this one. Oh, on. I, okay. Spring that on me. And then I got something to say. Yeah. Uh, how much do you think is going on behind the scenes? I did two shows yesterday. You had Bradley Hallman stepping away from the elite series. And we had Jordan Lee on last night uh, on a special edition BTL talking about returning to the Bassmaster elite series in 24. There's either 12 or 13 BPT guys that are no longer going to be on the BPT this year for a myriad of reasons. And then you had Bobby Lane going from the elites or from the open EQs back to the BPT. You got guys going to the MPFL. You got, uh, invitational guys go into the opens at that top level though how much communication is going on between guys do you think you've you've been there you've been there with discussions when stuff was going down and you were on the tour were you constantly talking to your buddies on tour or they were talking to everyone else or is this a thing where everyone's making individual deals and mind and kind of doing it on their own no because here look when i and and pa paul elias could probably attest to this and some of the other um, guys that have built very big names for themselves. Mm -hmm. I was very boisterous about the tournament trails becoming much more angler friendly. Um, I fought and kicked and screamed all the way, and I was not quiet about it. Um, I made a lot of friends in the process. I made a lot of enemies in the process. I never burned a bridge because every trail, everybody's an individual and every trail that's out there will suit some individual's needs better than others. Mm -hmm. So they're going to gravitate towards what they think their needs are going to be fulfilled. Like now, part of the problem is when you got guys going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth at that point in time, I think it becomes more of an excuse than a need. Um, because look, in order for you to make it in any trail, you got to put your time in on that trail. And so if you don't like the format of one trail and you go to another trail and you dip your toes in the water and then you bail and go back, you're not giving anybody a fair shake, any trail a fair shake. Um, like, I, like I'm a believer. No, this is no put down on any bass trails out there. I'm a believer in Bassmasters. When I grew up, that's all I wanted to do is be a Bassmaster. Mm -hmm. That's the only dream I had was to be a Bassmaster, fish at the highest level, make a classic, win events. That was my goal. And Bassmasters was it for me. Um, I started out in Redman, which was which would be equivalent to BFLs today. Mm -hmm. I started out in Redman. I, I I fished a few seasons in the Redman division. Um and then I fished a lot of team tournaments. I fished a ton of tournament trails growing up because the, I needed I wanted more tournament experience. Um and I wanted to see many different lakes. Like before I ever went to Bassmasters I fished a tournament trail in North and South Carolina just to get myself familiar with those fisheries, the spotted bass fisheries, because you have to understand something. The only time when I grew up, the only thing place we had spotted bass was on the Ohio river and one reservoir in Ohio and the spotted bass in the reservoir were, were not worth fishing for, mm -hmm. but the ones on the Ohio river, we used to win a lot of money catching them. Well, the Ohio river changed its complexion a lot and now it's become a smallmouth fishery where in the beginning it went from large mouth to spots to small mouth. And so, so now you got it, you parts of the river will have all three, but you're going to be hard pressed to win it on one specific species. So I needed to get out of this state to, to experience things. So I, I fished a lot of different tournament trails. Some I thought were run poorly. Some I thought were run excellently. Um, and I, and I fished FLWs. I mm -hmm. fished those events too. potlucked a lot of them. Um, I still believe in my heart and in my soul that Bassmasters for me 
was the way to go. And so I never, I never put my time in another trail. Now I potlucked a couple just because I was laid over at, at that area and the event was coming. So I'm like, I'm here, I'm going to fish it anyway. Um, and so that's, that's what I did. So, you know, I, yes, anglers talk hundred percent anglers talk mostly between friend to friend mm -hmm. um except for me because i would i would come unglued on things you know when <laughs> when they had when i won rookie of the year they didn't recognize it and which, i said and i which said, rubbed hey, you the wrong way it did terribly and i said hey look there's got to be a money prize for this because this guy the guy that wins rookie of the year is the guy that needs the money the most and so there has to be, and the very next year, they, I think they gave them free entries in 10 grand or something like that, um, the very next season. But I complained and I shouldn't say complained. I just pleaded my case. Brought to not, their attention the injustice. Right. Not that I was ever going to get the money. Okay. Cause I already won it and I already got nothing for it. I got a little mm -hmm. trophy about that big. Um, and so that's, you know, that's kind of you know the deal i i i think the jumping over now i'm mad i don't know i mean um when at when when it when flw first came on the playground there was a lot of guys that bailed on bass and went i think they did that because there was a lot of promises made and um you know what i mean yeah. there was a lot there was a lot of promises made and guy and guys wanted you know to stop fishing for their own money basically mm -hmm. um and i don't but that's not how it happened that's not what happened so then you had guys that were disgruntled and went back and and so now you're getting this ebb and flow again because things are changing you know what i mean uh-huh i was thinking about bobby so bobby started his career with flw then he went to the elite series. Mm -hmm. Then he went to the Bass Pro Tour. Then he went back to the Opens, and now he's back at the Bass Pro Tour. Right. I mean, that's that's mm -hmm. a lot. And I don't hold any of it against him whatsoever. Whatever no. works for you and your family, that's how the world goes around. And the more options that guys at the top level have, more power to them. Options, right. options, uh, options lead to accountability. Well, yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, here, look at the end of the day, the angler's got to do what's right for the angler because nobody else is looking out for you. Yep. I mean, that, I hate to say that, but it's the truth. No, it a hundred percent is. As long as we're fishing for our own money. Okay. How much of a professional event is it really? I mean, you know, but part of the problem too is when you have guys bouncing from league to league all the time, back and forth, back and forth, how do you substantiate what's a pro and what's not a pro? Um, in other words, if you're going to, if you're going to not fish for your own money, there has to be like, I thought they were going to do it when they made the elites mm -hmm. or the top one hundreds. I thought, okay, they're going to, they're going to narrow you down to a hundred guys. Those are going to be the pros. And those guys are going to not fish for their own money, but it never materialized that way. You know, like, like yeah. here you like, okay. Aside from that gig, cause that is controversial. And, um, I used to get, you know, my brains kicked in every time I brought that up with mm -hmm. all, all organizations. Um, in my opinion, the only thing Bassmasters needs to do is make a championship for the open anglers. They've tried that back and forth. They've tried that number of times. I don't know why it hasn't stuck. I don't either. Because if they if they had a championship for the open anglers, because there's a lot of guys that fish the opens that a could never fish the elites, not because they're not good enough, because of money. Mm -hmm. Some guys have good jobs and don't want to sacrifice that to try to go fishing. So their pie in the sky is to try and win one and make a classic. Mm -hmm. If you put it, if you give them an, a championship that's worth decent money. I think you'll have a lot of guys stay in that full field for the entirety. 
-hmm. because here's the deal. The guys that are doing all nine of them, most of those guys want to make the elites. Now there's a lot of those guys that want to just do nine because they want to do nine events. They just want to do nine. Um, but you got to give you got to give the anglers something to lean on if they don't make the elites there's a championship where they could have the potential to win money so the season's not worthless because it would have kept me in it if the top 50 mm-hmm. made a uh, open championship out of even 170 i guarantee you i would have been at the last open and andrew upshaw would have been at the last open damn right you would have been because you'd have a chance to win a 100,000 or 150 mm-hmm. Um, of course you would. And so, you know how it is in the opens. Um, if, if you're not fishing all nine to make the elites, once you realize that your number, your chance of making the elites is slipped away from you, you'll see the drop off in the last events, the, the, the participation drops way off, but by keeping it, by keeping an open championship, you keep the participation level up there. Mm-hmm. And so your drop off is not that uh, that much. I talked to talked to someone in the know, so to speak, and I haven't mentioned this before. Already over 150 anglers signed up for all nine opens next year in 24. Yeah. There were 176 that did it uh, in 2023. That's that's a little more than half the field. Yeah. Before uh, before we I went on this tangent, you said there was one thing that you wanted to get in before we wrap. Oh, yeah, up. yeah, yeah. So uh, for anybody who doesn't who has not signed up for the newsletter, the, the lure net newsletter. OK, this is a good good thing to sign up for because you get notifications on things that are coming up, sales that are coming up. Um, so you're you're in the know. You know what I mean? Because because a lot of this stuff is limited runs only. So so you'll get the notification and you you'll have an opportunity to get a first crack at it. But so anybody who hasn't previously signed up for the newsletter, um, if you sign up for the newsletter, there's going to be a $500 new product giveaway. They're going to, oh, wow. they're going to draw the names out of a hat and the winner's going to get $500 towards product. So, um, just a, just incentive to sign up for the newsletter. There now, it is right there. Just on the main page, you just scroll down. It says subscribe to our newsletter, put your email address in, and you're, and you're, you're subscribed. And you're in. And then you got a chance to win $500 worth of lures. Um, so it's kind of worth it. Um, it's not. The newsletters will have videos, how-to videos in them. It's not all, you know, it's not 100% in your face by this crap. It's they got information on there mm-hmm. that that's good There's information. tips and tricks from uncle Frank in there. Yeah, there could be <laughs> there. There won't be any cooking tips in there. You can, that only... was a hell of a show. I like this show. We actually got real serious. We did the hard sell on some stuff and we, we got uh, crappie tacos waiting in your kitchen. I know I'm going to smash that thing for lunch, dude. It's going to be money. I hear the music. Uh, Anything else? No, man, this was good. I, I gave that a gonna, 50% chance of working and it worked. So I think we're going to, now that I know we can keep the reception down there, I think we're going to have to uh, periodically uh, rifle in a cooking segment. I like it. Let's do a, a semi annual, which would mean every six months. So we've got like a 4th of Perfect. July summertime. And then we've also got one going into the winter. Perfect. Love it. All right. This has been another edition of day four with the man, Frank Scalish. Uh, next Thursday. Is that Thanksgiving? I got to look on my handy dandy calendar. No, hey, I, I got to do a, I got to do a, I got to do a birthday shout out to my wife. Whose birthday was yesterday. 40th birthday. Congratulations. Right. 35th Happy birthday. Yeah. I think next <laughs> Thursday is, uh, the, is Thanksgiving, isn't it? Yeah, it is. The 23rd. Uh, you want to knock something out on like the 20th or the 21st next week early? We can. All right. Yeah, let's do that. We, we, we got to roll. I don't want to want to lose that stuff. Well, just stay tuned to BassZone.com. Look at the schedule on that. We'll also throw it out on the social media. We might be cooking a turkey. No. <laughs> It'll be a nine-hour show. <laughs> a a nine-hour live just on the turkey. I'll be sitting in front of the oven like this. I still think 
<laughs> I still think my idea before we went live where you just boil a hot dog and eat it in silence on the show is the greatest idea ever. <laughs> Dude, that's so it would be like art. It would be it like would an be. abstract cooking art. It would be. It would be performance art. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll see everybody sometime next week. Thanks, Frank. Later. <laughs>